rising from the sand of Saudi Arabia, a structure designed to make history. The first time I saw this project, I was just overwhelmed. You have organic, freeform shapes. Nothing like it has ever been attempted. This is the most experimental deep dive into technologies that we've ever done. The stakes are enormous. The question is not what is difficult, the question is what is not difficult. The pressure is unrelenting. You know what's the plan. Somebody can do it faster than me. A lot of confusion, a lot of tension. Uh, <laughs> there was some kind of communication problem or something. Engineers, you bring them something simple, they will complain. You bring them something complex, they will complain. But if builders succeed, they'll help propel this nation towards a bright future. These young children, they are the future leaders, innovators. They are the future sound. And unveil a new wonder of the world. People will wonder, how was it built? How was it done? The city of Dahran, in Saudi Arabia's eastern province, the kingdom's main oil-producing region. For the past 10 years, commuters on the main highway have been seeing an unusual set of structures slowly rising from the sand. But what they could not see was the massive struggle the sheer force of human will that it took to build. The project's name, Ithra, an Arabic word meaning enrichment or enlightenment. That's also its stated mission, to instill in each visitor a love of learning and curiosity. Can it be done? Can a set of buildings change a society? Will Ithra succeed? When we started the excavation of the project, there was nothing other than sand and dust. I was thinking, is this what the people who built the pyramids we're facing. There's tremendous pressure on us, on the whole team, from every possible aspect, from management, contractors, vendors, from the public. From day one, we know that there will be sweat, there will be tears, and there will be blood. But that's what it takes to do great things. That's what it takes to do timeless things. It takes crews two years just to prepare the site and pour concrete for five unusually shaped structures. More than half of Ithra's interior will be underground, a four-story subterranean complex to be covered by a poured concrete roof. The roof will be landscaped with eight square kilometers of gardens and walking paths. The roof is so large, concrete for it must be poured a section at a time. Today we are going to cast slab number 18, around 900 cubic meters of concrete. It will require 90 trucks worth of wet concrete. A concrete pour this large takes clockwork-like coordination. We need to make sure that from the batch plant till the concrete is in place is not more than 90 minutes. If a truck is delayed, 
the concrete inside will start to harden before it can be poured, and the truck will be rejected. Today, planning has paid off. The trucks arrive on schedule. Crews work all day and into the night to complete the pouring, spreading and leveling the concrete. Next morning, the section is starting to cure. Another piece of the puzzle is in place. The Ithra project was conceived and funded by Saudi Aramco, the national oil company. But why? Why would an oil company build a center for cultural enrichment? We wanted to create a big magnet, something that is uh, exceptional, of global significance, that when people see it, they say, inspire the curiosity, the, the sense of wondering, what is this all about? I want to come, I want to see it. The mission is to make a tangible impact in the development of the kingdom through uh, nourishing the love for knowledge, creativity, and cross-cultural engagement. But that is not as simple as it sounds. In Saudi Arabia, there has been a fairly quick jump from very archaic structure to industrialism, much faster than many other countries. So the need to set sort of benchmarks for that development has been extraordinarily important. There is a whole series of buildings that describes the interests of society at that particular point in time. It could be the Opera House in Sydney. It could be the Guggenheim in Bilbao. It could be the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The iconic elements of architecture are very, very much related to self-recognition, pride even. When the Norwegian firm Snohetta, known for their innovative work, was asked to participate in a competitive bid for the center's design, they were surprised to get the call. We'd never heard of any big cultural buildings in Saudi Arabia before. We only had our preconceptions of what Saudi Arabia was. So to get a phone call saying, are you interested in doing a cultural center in Saudi Arabia, is, I think, quite unusual, and that sort of intrigued us. The design goal? To create a structure so unique, it would inspire curiosity and excite the imagination. The building needed to be something recognizable, something that you can tell stories about, something that you need to communicate to a larger public something they will recognize and connect to, as if it was something you could just stumble over in the desert. Snowheda's design featured a suite of rounded, interlocking buildings, all jacketed in gleaming metallic skin. They use an element that sometimes we try to shy away from, which is the, the desert. They were not trying to camouflage what is there, and this is what I like about it. I cannot imagine it anywhere else. Snowheda's proposal beat out competing designs from the world's top firms. It was beautiful, but still just an idea. And it was so different, so unprecedented. Could it be built? When I first saw the drawings of the building, it didn't look like something impossible to do or very difficult or challenging. But I think as you learn more, the complexities, the details become evident. And you're like, well, how is this going to work? How is that going to fit together? Which one are you going to do first?
In fact, the plans were phenomenally ambitious. The project would require massive quantities of rare materials brought in from hundreds of countries. It would require an international crew of thousands, speaking dozens of languages. Use safety, full body harness. If you see any unsafe, you have to ask your form. Raise your hand. And they would have to adjust quickly to some of the harshest working conditions on Earth. Temperatures here can soar past 50 degrees Celsius. In summer, work could only be done at night. The building was the body, but that body will, will be a dead body if it doesn't have a soul. The mission will not be realized. How could a set of buildings inspire a love of learning and creativity? What would Ithra offer? Aramco and Snohetta designers work hand in hand for two years, developing the center's specific functions. The best projects we have are the ones we make together with the client. So in many ways, I, I understand that the client is looking for a partner, but we are also looking for a partner. The team starts using a nickname for the center's rounded buildings. They call them pebbles. Each pebble will house a unique cultural or educational function, a world-class library, a live performance hall, an education center, a great hall for traveling exhibits, an innovation lab, the underground will house galleries, interactive children's exhibits, and administrative offices. A tight schedule means that construction must begin right away, before all technical drawings are finished. So the engineers will have to work fast just to stay ahead of the construction crew. Grand architectural concepts need to be translated into the precise language of builders. To do that, one of the world's leading engineering firms, Bureau Happold, was brought onto the project. They were tasked with creating the detailed drawings, instructions to guide the work teams. It was no simple task. There would always be the aspiration of the architect and the practicality of the engineer. Rather than give an answer that this is not possible, not achievable, we'll work hard with the architects to try and deliver the organic form that they want to try and achieve. Simon Curtis was the project's lead structural engineer. He knew he was facing the toughest assignment of his career. The first time I saw this project, I was just overwhelmed. It just seemed such an amazing building. Standard buildings are designed as rectangular boxes. That's because engineers understand how this form distributes its weight. A column works on compression, a beam works on bending. The way you analyze a column is quite different from the way you analyze a beam. With Snowhetter's design, you start off with a column at the ground. That column will go up and be supporting a wall. But then when does that wall then cease to be a wall and become a roof? When does a column cease to be a column and become a beam? To create these curved shapes, the steel must be cut and welded at unconventional angles. Every component is a prototype, one of a kind. It's not something you can go buy off. It's just not a two by four that you stand up straight and frame out like you would in a normal construction. And the challenge is not just getting the angles right. It's making sure that when all the pieces are assembled, 
the buildings will be safe to occupy. With these free-form shapes, you're almost having to go back to first principles with everything. You've got to take loads from up in the air and get them down into the ground. Or, in the case of wind loadings, you've got to take loads that come sideways and you've still got to get them down into the ground. The architectural challenges of a building such as this makes the route to getting all of those loads to the ground very, very complicated. One of the most experimental features of the design calls for the smallest pebble to appear to float in midair. Nestled between two larger pebbles, it's called the keystone to symbolize stability and interdependence. Each piece is depending on the other to actually be erected, to stand up. But the keystone is the most important. If you remove it, our building would basically collapse. Today, the crew will start assembling the keystone. Plans call for this piece to go in first, a support truss connecting to the adjacent pebbles on either side. But when the crew starts to lower the truss into position, something is clearly wrong. Wow. Oh, my heart. It turns out the truss is coming down at a tilt. That's usually not a problem, but in this case, it's getting caught in the narrow gap between buildings. Very complicated. So the crew needs to lower it to the ground and fix the rigging. It takes the crew six hours of trial and error. Eventually, they get it right. And this time, okay, okay. the truss slides snugly into position. The first piece of the keystone is in. Another task complete. But like so many other tasks on this project, it took a lot longer than expected. It's becoming clear the original three-year schedule will not be met. As well as you can plan for a project, I don't think you can fully encompass everything that's going to take to get it done. Not in terms of money, nor resources, nor time. As they say, the devil's in the details, and that's where you really have to be careful, so you can't rush it. With the truss installed, the Keystone crew can plow ahead. Continue, continue. Over the next few weeks, the rest of the steel for the Keystone is assembled into place. The Keystone presented an extreme engineering challenge. The building must support over 700 tons of its own weight, as well as the weight of visitors, while suspended in midair. Most buildings don't have to do that, but there are structures that do. With the Keystone, we'd moved away from building engineering into bridge engineering. So effectively, what we've created is a bridge. As a structural engineer, you enjoy the challenges of doing something that nobody's ever done before. But I had a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out how to do it, if I'm honest. Structural steel skeletons are almost complete. Today, the team begins work on one of the project's most critical components, its insulation layer. One of the biggest costs of running a building is in the cost of cooling that building. So from the sustainable buildings approach, we try to minimize that cost to keep the center's interior spaces cool and dry, the pebbles will be fitted with a tight weather seal, an insulating skin in the form of panels, 
attached one by one to the steel skeletons. The weather skin keeps the natural elements out of the building. We do have very expensive and very high-end finishes on the inside, materials that uh, are used in a way that have never been used before. So replacing them or damaging them in any way would be uh, relatively catastrophic. So it is absolutely critical that all these panels are put in place in such a way that totally seal off the building from the outside elements. This panelized weather skin is another of the center's innovations. Nothing like it has ever been tried. The panels are packed with dense foam. Each has a unique shape designated for a specific location, like a jigsaw puzzle. Brackets mounted on the steel serve as the attachment points. But as soon as the crew starts installing the panels, they're forced to stop. The brackets are all slightly out of position. Nearly a thousand of them. Because the panels must form a perfect seal, there is no room for error. The tolerances we are working to are millimeters. <laughs> Normally, you have much more millimeters uh, space to maneuver the things. Apparently, there is some kind of communication problem or something. The cause of the problem is soon discovered. It turns out that the bracket installers had been working from an outdated version of the project's 3D computer model. This is the latest model. I haven't seen it. But the model that we have transmitted to the parallel works was put in the system a long time ago. Because different teams are working simultaneously on different aspects of the project, it's imperative that everyone work from the same version of the model. But the engineers are revising the model daily, sometimes hourly. Crews also make on-site revisions. Keeping everyone up to date on the changes would be impossible without the use of advanced collaborative 3D modeling software adapted specifically for the project. The model shows every curve, every angle, every piece of steel, every connection, every nut and bolt. It rotates and can be viewed in layers. The model is supposed to be continuously updated with the latest revisions. But that's easier said than done. I have personally, and no one of my team has ever seen this steel. It's very frustrating. You're saying you have communicated all the information, then it comes up that obviously everything is wrong and you can start from scratch. Many of the times I felt that the morale of the people was kind of hitting rock bottom. Keeping the energy firing was a major challenge. We need to continue. It's going to happen. Now working from the updated model, the crew makes adjustments to all thousand brackets. The fix takes two weeks. Pull up. And this time, the panel snaps securely into place. But even the computer model can't solve every problem. The weather sealing of the library pebble is behind schedule. That's due to a problem installing the final steel beam. 
when workers tried, they found that attachment holes didn't line up. The team calls Craig Garrett, chief engineer in charge of the model. The problem is right here at various points. According to the model, the pieces should be lining up perfectly. Have you taken into account the strawing? Craig decides to step away from the virtual project and visit the physical work site. If you're struggling to understand something, if you really want a sense of, of the real space, we have to go there. Craig inspects the problem area. Nothing seems wrong. But then he notices something. A temporary support beam rigged to hold up the corner of the library during construction has settled slightly into the sandy ground. The overhanging library steelwork is actually starting to sag slightly under its self-weight. The team makes an adjustment, jacking the support beam six centimeters. Once again, the last steel piece for the library is airborne. And this time, it locks in with ease. Weather sealing the library pebble can begin. The insulation layer is a mission critical component, but it's only the undercoat. And as the final panels are fitted into the steel, crews can turn their attention to the most visually striking element of the center, its outer skin. It was a dazzling feature of the concept drawing, but how to build it remained an unanswered question. This was a gleaming metallic surface, mirror-like. How were they going to build this? How were you going to get that effect? You couldn't see any seams. There were no joints. The surface became one of the most problematic issues on the project. We knew that the basic geometry of these pebbles started to become so complex that we almost couldn't define the surfaces geometrically. So we went back and said, what describes this geometry in the most simple manner? Well, the line. The cladding as a concept was so simple, a metal wire wrapped around each pebble. But how would you build it? How would you construct it? A possible solution? Steel tubing. Could the building be wrapped with curved tubes, as if fitted with a steel veil? Nothing like it has ever been done. Stainless tubing is sent through a computer-controlled bending machine. Bending 75,000 tubes, and every tube is different. Mm -hmm. 
Each tube is equipped with a barcode so that the installers on site can 100% determine where to put that special tube. Three hundred seventy five kilometers of tubes will be fastened to these brackets, nearly a quarter million of them. They're made of titanium, chosen for its unique combination of strength and flexibility. The design calls for the tubes to be suspended 12 inches above the insulating panels to create a layer of cool air between them. The idea of the stainless steel tubes is that wherever the sun's shining on the building, you're always having a shadow cast on the actual cladding of the building. So what happens is the sun shines onto the stainless steel tubes, the tubes heat up, the wind blows between the tubes, cools the tubes down, and the heat doesn't get onto the environmental part of the cladding. So the vast majority of the building, in effect, whilst it's sitting in the desert, is actually in shade. But the design is untested. That's a worry for project leaders. What really keeps me up at night is the integrity of the facade. And I look at it and say, OK, will it stand water? Will it stand the wind? Will any dust go inside the building? One concern is the sheer weight of the tubes. They're to be hung off the insulating panels. If that load causes any panels to shift, it could break the weather seal. This worry has held up work on Ithra's interior. Managers can't risk exposing the sensitive interior finishes like copper, marble, and soft textiles to extreme temperature or humidity. So a testing firm is brought in to see if the weather seal will hold. They construct a small section of the tubing and panel system to put to the test. Please bear in mind that once we start the test, we will not open the door. Congratulations, guys. Congratulations. Good, good. The test is a success. Installation can begin on the steel tube skin, the first of its kind. Meanwhile, here in northern Italy, a very special tree is taking shape. This world-renowned foundry is constructing the 28-meter-high sculpture, which will become Ithra's symbolic centerpiece. Sculptor Giuseppe Pannoni and his team will work for over two years to complete it. The tree will be installed in an open-air atrium at the base of the center, symbolic of the kingdom's first discovery of oil near this very spot. Surrounding it will be a forest of 42 twisting wood columns, each 25 meters high. focusing on non-standard timber structures, architectural timber structures that are very often 
um, coming with difficult shapes, freeform shapes. Ithra's columns are made from a blend of woods chosen for beauty, strength, and flexibility. They are glued, pressed, twisted, and trimmed. We are using state-of-the-art technology to do all the production. The machine itself has an accuracy of one thousandth of a millimeter. It takes this facility half a year to craft the 42 columns. But wood is vulnerable to warping. The columns must be kept cool and dry at all times. And this is a problem. The columns are now arriving at the construction site. But delays have pushed the project over a year behind schedule. The columns cannot yet be installed. They must be stored. Where are we going to store those columns? Ideally, you would have some degree of climate control inside the building. You'd have your HVAC, your air conditioning. But this is the only place on the job site long enough to put them in. And if, in fact, they are going to put them in here, this is not climate controlled. I don't seem to be getting answers to those questions, and it's a continuing concern. There are a thousand different suppliers, fabricators, vendors, subcontractors, because of all the different components in the building, all the different materials. So there, there's all kinds of frustrations that are born. You know what's the plan, because we share it with you. Somebody can do it faster than me, welcome. And so it makes for very interesting meetings and, and activities on the site. Check and review the situation again. Yeah, I, have no, I, have, I have nothing in hand. Why are linking? And I will not. I will. The Ithra construction site, installation of the tube skin is proceeding. Slowly. No one has ever wrapped a building in steel tubes before. The crew must learn on the job. Inside the center, however, Another crew is using an old technique. In fact, it's thousands of years old. It's called rammed earth. Rammed earth, the oldest known way to build. People used to build with the material they had around, which was mainly soil, clay, stone, and water. This ancient building material was chosen to give Ithra's future-looking design a connection with the past. Make everything on this land, then we put the corners. Perfect. What we did was reintroduce the old knowledge of rammed earth and modified it and adapted it and brought it back into, into the present moment. Rammed Earth crew creates over 750 slabs, each one weighing over a thousand kilos. When complete, these dense walls will form an additional layer of cooling insulation for the center. Work site, the pace has picked up. The steel tube skin is nearly complete. And 
the inside team has begun installing the delicate finishes. Today, the first of 42 enormous wood columns is scheduled for installation. Delivered to the site a year ago, the columns have been stored in a warehouse. The building was retrofitted with air conditioning to keep the wood from warping. Today, the columns will be unboxed for the first time. The columns will be bolted in place at the base and on top. First, each five-ton column must be carefully lowered into position. This delicate step requires two cranes working in tandem. The installation is really, really difficult, but we don't have any spares, so it means that there is no room for error. First, the column is lifted horizontally. Then one end is dropped into the atrium slowly. Amazing column. It was an idea. Now it comes back to truth. It is fact now. But nothing comes easy on this project. We have to go in a little down and this way. Good, wait a more, more, more. Something is wrong at the upper connection point. Could the columns have warped in storage? It turns out that the column is not the problem. It's the prongs of the upper bracket. They're too thick and must be cut. It's been a 12-hour day. The first column is in. It's a moment of celebration. Taking in all the excitement are some of the youngest members of the team. Sunlight, nice. A major goal of the project is to develop a new generation of architectural talent. I cannot tell you exactly what I learned since I came here because it's a lot. I've been learning every day a new single thing. I just graduated and this is my first project that I'm working with a helmet. From college you have this idealistic view of the workplace and I think they were able to carry that idealism through onto this project. But they did learn the realities of dealing with contractors, dealing with budgets. So I think they did take away a lot. With completion close at hand, architect Chettle Thorson pays a final site visit. Now the glunum column. Yeah, I saw them starting to mount. The first one took about 12 hours. Yeah, yeah. They had a very hard time. But they're fantastic, you know? I didn't know exactly where we would be. Read the reports, seen the pictures. But, you know, it's different to see something in reality compared to when you see it in a, in a photograph. You get humbled, you know, by people actually building this.
With the exterior nearing completion, the interior finish work shifts into high gear. As beautiful surfaces and details begin to emerge, the team leaders can step back for a moment of reflection. The journey was not perfect. So much emotion, so much sacrifice. I think what happened is really nothing less than a miracle. <laughs> to actually walk through the space and experience it is a very powerful feeling. Seeing it grow from its infancy and the spaces forming and enclosing, you kind of feel a part of it, really. It's, it's your building. <laughs> it's, it's you, actually. It's a very special moment, a sacred moment. This place is coming to life now. It's standing tall and giving us a statement. I'm here, I'm for real, I'm ready. It feels just wonderful. We're living in very interesting times here in Saudi Arabia. There is a lot going on. And I think there is no better timing than now. So uh, we are very excited. After more than a decade of planning and construction, Ithra is having its opening day. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. خادم الحرمين الشريفين الملك سلمان بن عبد العزيز آل سعود أيده الله Of course, the real work of Ithra is just beginning. It's not just about a beautiful building, but it's about a mission to transform societies uh, and lives. Really, the effect will be three generations from now. This is planting the seed. There is nothing like seeing a glimpse of curiosity in a child's eye. They are the future leaders, the future artists, innovators. They are the future Saudi. The center is telling us that we should dream as high as we want and we can aim as high as we want. We can realize those dreams.